Nier is a cult classic that was released back in 2010 on the PS3 and the Xbox 360. Originally produced in two versions, Gestalt and Replicant. We only got the first one controlling an overwhelmed father in search for a cure for his daughter's fatal disease. In Replicant, it's the same story except you now play with a concerned brother. Recently, however, a remake of Replicant was released worldwide to critical acclaim. So today we are going to look into 10 things you may not know about this masterpiece. Number 10. The Stupidity of Metacritic and IGN The original Nier just told we got outside Japan was a commercial failure. Even though there was a huge marketing strategy for it on behalf of Square Enix, the game didn't meet the expectations. It's understandable though, considering they are the most popular JRPG developers of all time. So just imagine those expectations coming straight out of websites like Metacritic or IGN. Unfortunately, they destroyed the game, especially focusing harsh on its gameplay mechanics and visuals. While there was barely anything wrong with them, they were expecting a masterful action RPG that could be flawless and revolutionary. Because after all, the story was indeed praised but not really held into high regard either. Critics struggled with camera, controls and the bullet hell sections that were deemed annoying. So the rating was mixed and that stopped a lot of people from buying the game. Nowadays though, Nier has become a major cult classic, considered as one of the best action RPGs on the PS3 and 360. Too bad these two websites, whose reviewers probably didn't really finish or even play the game, misunderstood it and bashed it. Their stupidity cost the game a fortune and Kavia, the development studio, went broke. That very same year though, it was absorbed by AQ Interactive and thankfully continued making games. Number 9. Version 1.22474487139 Nier Replicant starring brother Nier trying to cure his ill sister was the version that stayed in Japan. Remember how I said there was a huge marketing strategy involved? Well, it was the fact that Square Enix thought a more mature, fatherly figure would appear more to Western audiences, so Replicant stayed behind. However, seven years later, after the huge commercial success of Nier Automata, Square Enix and Yoko Taro, the director of both games, reconsidered Replicant. They decided it was a good opportunity for business to remaster the first Nier in order to save its reputation. The goal was to make it wide available for modern audiences as to emphasize its importance in the Nier universe. However, instead of remaking Gestalt, they thought it would be better if the world met now Brother Nier instead. During development though, Taro and the developers realized the project had a lot of potential, so it immediately jumped from a mere remaster to a full remake. They even brought back Takahisha Tora from Platinum Games back, who had previously designed the combat in Nier Automata. Calling Nier Replicant a remake will be troublesome because Yoko Taro didn't want it to be compared to Final Fantasy VII Remake. So, weird as he usually is, he decided to go with a different subtitle. The result was the square root of 1.5, which in itself meant it was the same game as Just Help, but definitely not a sequel, so it couldn't be called Near 2, right? Yoko Taro decided it was something in between, as to make Replicant an updated version of the original. Number 8. Drakengard led to Nier for all the wrong reasons. Yoko Taro's first project as a game director and scriptwriter for Square Enix was the PS2 dark and twisted action RPG Drakengard. Taro always wanted to create a different protagonist than the usual charismatic trope trying to save the world, so he went overboard and created a completely insane character. Kavya was happy with this decision and immediately started developing the game. However, it was planned to be a standalone title with zero possibility of becoming a series. So Kavya approached Taro and told him the game would never have a sequel. Our beloved director decided then to cut his long universe and ideas down. But he wouldn't waste the story's potential, so he created several endings for it. 
one of them in particular that he really liked. But since this ending wasn't canon, Taro was left with a strong desire to continue on with another game. Angry, he abandoned Drakengard and Kavya, but since the game was very successful in Japan, he came back as a video editor for the sequel. He didn't work in anything else on it, but he was allowed to work later on a true follow-up of the original Drakengard. The result was a prequel called Drakengard 3. Nonetheless, he kept insisting on that particular alternative ending on the first game. So finally, his whims came true and Nier was born. It's so interesting that if Kavya hadn't told him that Drakengard would never have sequel, Tara would probably have not written that ending, and therefore Nier wouldn't exist. Number 7. Against all tropes. Yoko Taro's unusual and dark style led him to create a story in Nier that would go against the tropes. Once again, Kavya wanted something different from the usual stereotypes. Square Enix saw this as a challenge, but they wanted to prove to the world that they still supported dark and different stories. Taro and company had proven to be unique in storytelling with Drakengard 1 and 3. So how was Nier going to be like then? Well, just as dark, probably even more! Taro has said before that the many conventions of the video game market inhibit developers' creative freedom, meaning quite often, writers are forced to include all sorts of cliches and character tropes by the companies just to please a specific type of market. Nier went against all odds and broke as many stereotypes as it could to carve pure originality. It baffles me to see that Square Enix permitted such a dark product to be released, but I'm very happy about it. Number 6. The very tragic influence of the story In an interview with the development team, some rather gruesome things were said. Kavya's initial concept of the game was meant to really touch a nerve. They said the news these days were nothing but tragic tales about families in ruin, parents killing their children, or vice versa. In other words, violence, crime, and tragedy. So they took inspiration from this to do the exact opposite. Show a family who wanted to protect each other no matter what, even against impossible odds. All this while the rest of the world was precisely like in the news. But how was humanity going to be represented here? This is a spoiler-free video, so I won't really go into details, but if you play the game and reach that particular plot twist, you'll clearly see how these people on the news were represented in the game. How this loathsome and tragic reality came to embrace near story full of darkness and nerve-wracking twists. However, this wasn't the only thing that influenced the game's plot. Number 5. Yoko Taro's Personal Life When he was a kid, apparently he heard a story about a guy who fell from a roof and died. This left a huge impact on him. He got so caught up with the story, he tried breaking it apart over and over again in his mind, therefore developing a backwards script writing technique which consists of writing the ending first and then the rest of the story. Another technique he uses is photo thinking, which is a method of visualizing events and emotional scenes in a different order. Also, remember how the character Kaine was raised by her grandmother? Well, so was Yokotaro in real life. His parents were usually away when he was a child, so he was practically raised by his grandma. What kind of life he had with her remains a mystery, as Taro usually doesn't talk about it. All we know is that she left a strong impact on him. But after playing near, some speculation does come to mind. Taro has always stated his disdain towards the usual bland and innocent type of female protagonist. We sure saw a perfect example of that with Zero from Drakengard 3, right? Kaine was no exception. He wanted to create a completely messed up woman with certain characteristics uh, never seen before in the genre. And speaking about her... Number 4. The Kaine Controversy since this video doesn't include spoilers, I'll restrain from discussing Kaine's sexualization, which was done on purpose to disturb the audiences. Her very self is a controversial fact, because once again, it's a type of person rarely seen before in JRPGs. 
But one big controversial fact I'd like to discuss is one of the teasers of the game. Remember when I mentioned that the original Nier was a commercial failure outside Japan? One of the reasons involved this particular trailer that played the opening of the game. In that opening we see a scene that plays much later in the actual game, with Kaine making a huge rant. The rant, of course, includes swearing, most specifically against Grimoire Vice, one of the main characters of the game. You know how the West is an extremely oh so purely innocent and sensitive audience? Well, the teaser itself was criticized because of that, which led to parents rejecting the game, even if it was a mature rated game. On another side, it achieved the marketing strategy of Square Enix to get people's attention, to get people talking, to wonder and have an idea of what the game was going to be like, only to be completely wrong in the end. Well done, Square Enix, but too bad your friendly websites still crushed the game with unfounded criticism. Number 3. The Ikaruga Legacy We've talked a lot about the game's story, which is obviously its strongest point, but what about the gameplay? It's been said before that the action was trying to be a better version of any Kingdom Hearts out there. But why did Kavya decide to include shooter-like elements with bullet hell boss fights? Well, that was actually Yoko Taro again. He is a huge fan of the shoot-em-up game Ikaruga, originally released on the arcades and later ported to the Dreamcast and the GameCube. This is where he learned about the synchronization of gameplay and music, which actually inspired the dragon fights in the Drakengard games but he became more serious with the Nier games, something we also clearly see in Automata. Combining hack and slash with shoot em up was crazy for an RPG, even though other types of games had done it before. Taro and Kavya thought it was a good idea to incorporate them in order to keep the gameplay fresh and original, something that could give more variety to it. Perhaps Nier in the end was too original for its own good? I don't know, but that's exactly what I love about it. Number 2. The Chaos Language One more highly original theme in Nier was the music. It was mainly composed by Keiichi Okabe, head of the Monaka Composition Studio. Yoko Taro was also deeply involved and he wanted to create something different for it. The vocalist chosen for some of the music themes was none other than British singer Amy Evans, who actually lives in Tokyo. She was tasked not only with writing the lyrics, but also with creating an entirely new and fictional language for them. The reason was because Yoko Taro thought that way the lyrics wouldn't distract the player while running or fighting, since the player couldn't understand them at all. In order to achieve this, Okabe and Taro told Evans to base her writing on several different languages. Some of them included Gaelic, French, Welsh and even Latin. She thoroughly researched each language to create sentences that meant something, but at the same time nothing. Every single song had a different method, a diverse emotional background and obviously several specific made-up words based on other tongues. This was known as the Chaos Language. It just proves how extremely important was the soundtrack of the game, how Yoko Taro synchronized the music with the gameplay just like Ikaruga had taught him, but in a whole new level. That's how brilliant the music is in the Nier games. I will leave a full interview with Evans, which is very detailed, in the description of this video. Number 1. Toy Logic almost ruined the remake. You may already know this, but the Replicant remake was developed by a company called Toy Logic. The director of this remake was Saki Ito, a young figure in the video game industry. What you probably don't know is how troublesome and obnoxious was the development, mainly because Taro and Ito had communication issues. As I stated before, Square Enix was looking more at a simple remaster, but since the original game had been stupidly criticized for its gameplay mechanics, the studio brought Tora back to rework on it. Ito, however, wouldn't have it, and as a big fan of Automata, he really wanted to do something very similar. Having Nier move and attack as fast as the androids 
wouldn't make any sense though, so Ito had to tone down the action to make it seem more humane. Taro said in an interview that he had communication problems with Ito, making him feel that he was talking to a bird at times. In fact, when they met, Ito was bruised with scars and bandages because he had gotten drunk, running at full speed down a slope, and fell. Huh. Original producer Yosuke Saito had to intervene several times to clarify things, as well as Tora having more creative control over the gameplay mechanics. Thankfully, the development went well, and the game is currently a success. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to hand over the project to young developers from this new generation? But thanks to the original veterans, Toy Logic still did an amazing job. The remake came into existence and succeeded. No matter the version you play of this game, it's without a doubt a supreme work of art. Whether its abuse of originality is iconic or annoying, doesn't change the fact that there's barely any other game like it. It remains, as Yoko Taro's most turbulent story to date, one that it's amazingly written. This is a must play, any version out there, because it's simply one of those unique experiences you'll probably never duplicate. I'm so glad this remake was released though, as I think more players will finally be able to play it. That's all for today, people. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.